Um, okay, so the request had been to talk about the meaning of custom at all in a globalized world um, and the notion of ethnic identities at all and everything. And I, as I mentioned before, this is one of the topics that I find fascinating, totally underexplored. You know, if I do a PhD, this will be my, my topic. Hence, the source sheets are a bit long. Um, not that I'm going to read through all of it, but I figured I'd give you what I have at the moment on the, uh, on the sources. I, I Honestly, I've been thinking about this for many years from a halachic level, sociological level. So there's all types of sources um, in there. Um, let me let me lay out the problem. It's, out. it's, like, it's, like, it's just a packet of three, three sure am I given the topic. I taught it over three weeks or four weeks in, in Toronto. No, probably more. I think it took me like six weeks. Um, okay, so let's just sort of frame it. Much of halacha is and halachic authority and halachic practice is, in the classical sources, geographic-based. Um, we'll look at it from the lens of minhagim, of customs, um, but it's not just true of customs, it's true of halachic authority, where the classic, mat- mo- the classic model of halachic authority is mar da'atra. Um, and what does mar da'atra mean? Literally? Or mar da'atra, depending on where you, where, where you dive in. What does it mean? So it means literally, right? Mara, which is well, not really, is master, right? The atra of the place, exactly, right? The master of the place, right? He's the master of the place, right? In modern Hebrew, this word atar means website. Website, right? Why do you know that? Why do I know that? Because I had a weird. Every and if you go on a website, now you know when they say it's batar, it's on the website. Um, and it comes from the, from the Aramaic. So, Maradatra was the classic model of rabbinic authority, and it was geographic in nature, literally, Maradatra. Right? It's a, sort of a misnomer nowadays when, when people say that their shul rabbi is the Maradatra. He's not the Maradatra, he's the, the rabbi. rabbi of the shul. He's not, unless you only have one shul in the area, or alternatively, you have a Posek, who exercises authority over the entire city, you do not have a Mara Da'atra in the literal sense of that word. Yeah? Are we saying that a Mara Da'atra is like just halakha authority or like beyond, like almost like a mayor or something? No, no, in the, in the Gemara, this is halakhic authority, right? When this phrase is used, it's referring to halakhic authority. Um, and many of the halakhic models, are, the assumptions of halakha are geographic. Um, that's just the assumption. And that is not at all the reality. That is just not the reality that we live in. Um, we talk about ourselves being Ashkenazim or Svardim or whatever, a, you know, Hasidish or Litvish or from a Duda Mizrach or take your pick of halachic Jewish ethnic identity that we take. It dictates Often our practices, um, it you know whether it be kitniot on Pesach or um, how we rule on different halachic issues, right? We we act as if we're Ashkenazim, Svardim, whatever it might be. Um, but this is really weird. It just is because that's not how halacha ever worked, right? Halacha didn't work this way. Definitely not in the time of the Gemara. Um, and the question is, how do we get to the point which we are? Because we live in a very different world. When people 200 years ago talked about being Ashkenazim, what did they usually mean? They, were, they lived in a place. Yeah, they lived in a place that considered itself Ashkenazi, whatever. They lived in Poland. They lived in, you know, I mean, technically Ashkenazi is Germany, you know, is Germany. But, okay, let's... They meant that they had Eastern European minhagim or something like that, and if people said that they were, you know, Taimani, it was because they lived in Yemen, not because their grandfather or great-grandfather or great-grandparents lived in Yemen, but because they lived in Yemen. And so when they had customs based on the fact that they were Yemenite, it was because they lived in Yemen, and that's what they did in the city. Now, what happened if they moved? Then they would take on the minhagim. Then the normal halacha should say that you change your halacha. You moved. Right? If you moved, if someone moved from Yemen to France or to Poland, 
So then you would expect, and halacha would dictate this, that they would integrate into the new halachic society. Yeah. Uh, but isn't that weird when you think about, like, Rabbi Shonen, like, the Rosh, who brought Ashkenaz and Zik tradition into Spain? So, right, the Rosh is an interesting case, because the Rosh does move, um, but the question is what exactly happens there, right? There are certain things where he clearly takes local practices and becomes influenced by local Torah culture, and certain things that he brings... Um, and the question there is you do have to divide between custom and halachic traditions. Um, those aren't exactly the same. I said, right, these are similar models, but not exactly the same. Right? Customs, one would guess that the Rush kept the customs that in the new place while he was there, unless he thought they were halachically wrong, and then he can make a halachic argument and change practice. You can do that. So clearly he had studied in a particular halachic context, and he had those traditions, and that influenced him. There, there was a dissertation um, several years ago um, that was published by a woman, I think in Hebrew, could have been Bar Ilan, could have been Ben Gurion, I don't know, but in, in one of the Israeli uh, universities who pointed out that with the Rush, you actually see a shift, that he slowly does shift in terms of his, uh, his tendencies, in terms of how he learns. Um, the Rush writes three central works. Um, who, who's the Rush? If not everyone's following, who's the Rush? The son of the Torah. No, father the Torah of the Torah. The father of the Torah, Torah right? His name is Rabbeinu Asher. His son, Rabbi Yaakov Balatur, Yaakov ben Asher. So the Rush is the, of the, okay, basically, the, um, the last major Rishon in Germany, who stays in Germany, the end of the era of the Balatur in Germany is... The Marami Rutenberg, Rev. Mayor of Rutenberg, of Rothenburg, okay? Um, who, Aga, for reasons I'll explain in just a moment, are my wife, my, is uh, my wife's favorite Rishon, hence also the name of my oldest son. Uh, mayor, yes, I'm not kidding. Um, but my, my oldest son is mayor after the Marami Rutenberg, um, because when Or and I were dating, maybe first year we were married, we were in a graduate class together in NYU about the Balea Tosfot and our... Uh, Developed an obsession for the Marami Rutenberg. Um, Second choice. What? Second choice. He's, a, he's, a, he's an interesting character. So, anyways, the Maram, right? So, Marami Rutenberg is basically the last major reshown in Germany because Germany is collapsing and anti Semitism and all that things, and Maram dies in, in jail, right, having been captured for ransom and refuses to allow himself to be ransomed because he didn't want the community to be extorted based on the sugyot that say that uh, you can't allow yourself to be ransomed for more than the than the than your value because of encouraging um, subsequent kidnappings. So he has three main students. Um, and the way um, Professor Ephraim Kanerpogel notes it, his three main students realize what's happening. The writing is on the wall for Germany. Um, so they want to maintain Ashkenazi traditions. So what they do is they all write commentaries on Svardi halachic works, right? Who are his three main students? The Rosh. So one is the Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher. Wait, they're Ashkenazi, but they're writing. They they write their commentaries. They attach it right to Svardi works. The Rosh is technically attached to the Rif, right? To the Pairs of Yisrael Fasi. Um, then you have. The Mordechai, Mordechai ben Hillel, which is also written al Seder Harif, right? And the third is, right, the Hagot Maimoniot, right, who writes his commentary attached to the Rambam. Um, now the Rush moves in the middle of this craziness from Germany to Spain. He publishes three works, right? One is the Piske Harash. This is on the riff. Um, one is the Tosfot Rush, and one is the Shudha Rush, right? Is responsa. And um, so this woman pointed out, and I don't remember her name, Kanerfogel mentioned it in class, um, that the earliest work he writes is the Tosfot Rush. He's still living in Germany, and this is written in very Ashkenazi style as Tosfot. Um, then he writes, I think, the Piske Harash. Um, which is written as a halachic code, which is a much more Svardi style, though it does record much of the Ashkenazi traditions, um, his shubot are the most Svardi, right? The ones that are, that are latest. Um, so he does slowly seem to, to shift. You're right, it's not, this is not absolute. And what I will argue is that this shift is not completely new. There are evidence of this in the past, but I want to try to justify it. Yeah? But 
But also, you said earlier that when there was um, a battle or whatever, there was an argument between Custom and his halachic um, opinion, like he would decide like what to hit. What so to right, so halacha can override, right? Meaning, right, there are different types of custom. No, no, they're not. We're going to have to talk about that a little, right? A, a bit. Now, custom can mean different things, right? Now, we have to talk about this, but I'll, I'll outline a little bit of it. What can custom mean? Right, so sometimes custom means, right? What you do. Right? Non halachic. Right? Meaning, not against halacha, just non halachic. Right? Meaning, everyone agrees this is only custom, and it's binding by dint of the fact that it's a custom. Right? Um, to the extent that it's binding, right? This is. Sure, Kitneo, um, I guess to a certain extent, you want to give examples, Kabbalah Shabbos, that, right, Kabbalah Shabbat, that no one thinks is halacha, right, to the extent that it's meaningful, it's meaningful because of the minag, right, the custom, things like that. Now, there are also things which are sort of sometimes called minag, but they're not really in the classic sense. Um, they sort of blur the line, which is a custom to follow, a, right, a particular halachic position, which blurs the line, right, where you do have communities that as a community have accepted a certain um, halachic position, but as the Rajba notes in Etshuva and in, um, if you want to look it up, in Aleph, Rish, and Gimel, um, the Rajba notes, this is not really, right, this is, now this is actually a function of Mardatra, right, the Rajba notes, but it's not really binding 100%, if you had a strong compelling reason to rule against it, you'd be allowed to, um, so, um, these get blurred, obviously they were anti-halachic minhagim, um, right, anti-halachic, What does you know, that mean? Right, meaning minhagim that are wrong, right, but people do them anyways, but this is a reality, sometimes people will say, it's my minhag, right, they mean it's my minhag, even though it's just wrong, right, it just goes against halacha, is but, valid? what? So, that's an interesting question, right, this is a bit complicated, because there is a Yerushalmi that says, minhag, Oker okay, halacha, um, that custom can overrule halacha. The standard psak is that this is only in monetary cases because monetary cases are subject to custom in a way other things are not. Um, but it's not totally clear. The Gaonim don't really think that. The Gaonim think that if you have a speeding contradiction between the Gemara and Minog, you actually follow custom um, because they claim the reason that the Talmud is binding to begin with is because of custom, and therefore custom really does override. So it gets very complicated. Um, and custom means a lot of different things. Um, then there are things like there are two possibilities, not two halakhic positions, but two. Like in the Gemara, you have things that are like there are two valid sanctioned minhagim, and then it's dependent on minhag, which is somewhere in between these. There are all types of different of different customs, but all of these were were geographic. Now, in the 20th century, you basically get a shakeup of this entire system because suddenly right, we start primarily the reason that this really comes into um, into this discussion in the 20th century is because mass immigration for all types of terrible reasons, um, you know, or good, whatever, B both sort of the ones in the late 19th century, early 20th century, pre-war, um, but obviously to a much greater extent post-Holocaust, where Europe is basically decimated and people move, um, and suddenly you have a phenomenon that happened much less in other parts of Jewish history, where you have huge groups of people who move and take their traditions with them and recreate communities in America, in Canada, in England, in France, in Israel, obviously, um, and they maintain their identities. And suddenly, people don't think of themselves, when they think of their halakhic practice, as I live in Modi'in. So obviously I do what they do, right? The customs of Modi'in, they think of themselves as I go to this Ashkenazi shul, I go to this Sephardi shul, I go to this Temani shul, I go to this Chabad shul, I go to this Hasidish shtibol, whatever. Right? I am whatever I am. Um, and the question is, where does that come from and is it even legitimate? Um, a similar question, but not exactly identical, but related and necessary to understand it, is if you ask most people where their customs from come from, what do they say? My parents. Right? My parents, I do this because my parents do it. That's great, except according, as we'll see, according to most post -game, there is no such thing. The Minagavot is not a thing. It's not a category. It's not binding. It doesn't exist. 
Um, and this is not the, not the exclusive view, but actually, the, as we'll see, the majority view of classic halakhic literature. And the notion of parents minhagim is, for many people, the reason that they think they have to keep Ashkenazi Sephardi minhagim is because I'm bound to what my parents did. My parents, but that's not clear at all. Um, yeah. Good, so that blurs the line. But the reason that you started doing it doesn't matter because you still. So it might or might not. If you were under the right impression that you had to keep it because your parents did it, then that and it turns out that that's not true, which we'll see according to many postcards that's not true. Then that might be a good enough reason for you either to not have to keep it at all or to be allowed to be mater neder, right, and then not keep it. But people don't do that, right? People say, "No, I can't do that. I'm bound." Um, what? I, I know people who have also, um, but people usually do it on like a local custom, or if they get married, sometimes they'll, you know, sort of be mater neder on their entire uh, way of life, which is what Bovadia suggests. And start from scratch. Uh, um, now, related to this, obviously, is the conviction that people have that women must take the, their husband's minagim, which is also not nearly as clear as people think that is. Um, Ramosha Feinstein does indeed think that's true, or Pankin thinks that's not true. Um, for very compelling reasons. Um, Isn't there like a halakhic position that you're also allowed, like you could both get together and choose your own new minhagim together? Well, that would be, if you don't think that, uh, that you have to take any particular minhag, then obviously, you know, that would be a, a potential. Um, okay. Um, so this is just sort of a snapshot of what, right, the complexity of this issue. And like I said, it's the extent to which this has become front and center is, is um, much more powerful in the 20th century than it ever was. It's not, as we'll see, there is some precedent to it, and that's where we're going to have to look. There is some precedent to it, right? You have a little bit of this after the, uh, the expulsion from Spain in 1492. Right? You do have some of this. Um, but we, well, what I want to do, and I think it's going to take two weeks, but like I said, I'm not going to read everything here, but I wanted you to have the sources because... Again, I think this is very complicated. I think it's under-studied and really grossly misunderstood, um, which is why I spend so much time um, thinking about it. Um, but I want you to at least have the, the sources for what, if you want to follow up on it. Um, that's why like, I gave you a whole article by Rabbi Lamb. I'm not going to read the whole article by Rabbi Lamb inside, but I want you to have it in case you want to follow up on it. Um, okay. So, how do we want to do this? Um... The first question we really need to ask um, is, well, okay, right, I've made a lot of assertions here that, about why this is complicated, namely that the halachic model that Minag was usually based on, halachic traditions were based on, was geography. Um, so first we need to see whether what I just said is true. Is it in fact based on geography? Um, and if it's based on geography, the more subtle question is, was geography the actual halachic relevant factor, or was it a stand-in for something else? What? Like what? So we've talked about this a little bit, but was geography just the normal way that people drew social ties, right? You were part of a community, and that usually was geography. Does that, right? Can we realign that? Um, the evidence we're going to have to look for is to find cases in which someone moves. Can he keep his minhagim? Um, and we're going to have to look at whether uh, family minhagim have halachic legitimacy um, because that is a different type of alignment than um, makom. And if we find that family minhagim do have halachic power, that would indicate that geography is not the only alignment in halacha. If it turns out that geography overpowers family monogam or family monogam are not binding, um, then it may be that, at least in this category, the issue at hand really is geography uh, per se. Um, yeah? But if, um, like, social ties are, like, a more, like, possibly more valid than, like, geography, doesn't that validate the idea of keeping your family monogam? Sure. Sure. If you take that view, right, that's what that view is going to assume. The question is, does that stand up in the sources? Um, and that's really the question we need to, to start with. So the first thing we need to do is analyze the original category of minhaga makom, which clearly in the Gemara was the, um, 
the fundamental category of, of custom. Um, and then we've got to figure out, well, we've got to test it. Um, right? Was Minhagam Akom really, as it sounded like, only binding in a place? Is that really what it was or what it is? Um, so let's, should we break up for Harusa for a bit here? Um, no one likes breaking up for Harusa. Okay, fine. So that's fine. So let's, so let's, what? Fine. Break up for five minutes and read the first three sources. How about that? First three sources. These are just the central source, and I want you to see the um, the you know the first four. First four sources. Okay. First first four sources. You know what? I'll make it even easier. Just read source one and four. How about that? Just the two gemaras. Read the two gemaras. And if you have time, then read two and three. And if you have time, five. But start with the gemaras. One and two. Take five minutes, seven minutes, something like that. Okay, so let us, let us look at some of the sources here. So the, the central gemara um, is this gemara in, uh, in Psachim. The fourth parak of Psachim discusses Basically, entirely customs. The name of the parak is Makam Shunagu. Um, and the Gemara tells you as follows: That Haholech mi Makom she Osin la Makom she Ain Osin, O mi Makom she Ain Osin la Makom she Osin. So if you go from a place, the mission is talking about several different customs: the 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 custom of working or not working on the on the on erev Pesach. So the general rule in halacha is no nina lav chumrei makom sheyatsa misham vechumrei makom shalach l'sham. You accept the stringent practices of the place you left and the stringent stringent practices of the place you come to, which, according to the majority of um, poskim, means only in a case where you are merely traveling, not changing locations. If you change location, you become a member of the new city. But assuming you're traveling, so you have to maintain your local practices, and you cannot break from the stringent practices, right? You can't be going against, right? If the custom where you, the city you enter to um, is to not work on the day before Pesach, you can't be the only person working. And you cannot change, you cannot diverge because of dispute. The Gemara, that's right, that was the Mishnah. The Gemara then tells you the following story. B'nei Beishan, Nahu lo havu azlin mitzur letzidon b'malei Shabbata. So this is going to be the key phrase we need to understand. The B'nei Beishan had the custom of not traveling from tzur to tzidon, meaning even from two close places, where theoretically there should be no problem of traveling, but even close travel, they would not travel on Friday. So Atu Benayu Kamei Rabbi Yochanan. So the children came, or the Benayhem, let's say they're. Well, we'll have to go, de- define that. Came before Rabbi Yochanan, and Amrulo, and they said, and they asked essentially, can we diverge from this custom? Because they said, Avatenef Sharlo Lahu An and Love Sharlo, our our parents, our predecessors were capable of keeping this custom. It didn't impose on their life too much. We can't. Amr Lahu, he said to them, Kvar Kiblu Avotechem Alehem, Shnamar Shnam Shma Bini Musaravicha Valtito Sharat Imecha. Said, Too bad your fathers have already accepted this custom. And it says, listen, O children, to the instruction of your, um, or the rebuke of your father, and do not give up on, do not abandon the teachings of your mother. Okay? This is the central Gemara. Now, if I asked you, based on this, what type of minag is binding? What does it come down to? What is the ambiguous phrase here? Right? Binehem. Right? Binei Beishan. Right? All those. Why is this ambiguous? Because it could mean, like, their kids or it could mean, like, any descendants. Well, 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 be, let's think about it. It's, it's unclear. What is Beishan? Right? What are the two ways of reading this? Family or or place. Good. Right? This could either be the people who live in the city. Beishan, Bashan, one of those places. Or it can be the children of a family called Beishan. So either this means 
children, or this means, right, residents of. And then, each time you have been, you'll have to decide, right, are the parents literally their parents, or does that mean the preceding generations of this city? Now, there are, indeed, a minority of sources who say, and those are the ones I gave you first, um, but we'll see that they are the minority, who say that it is, in fact, children, and therefore, the classic models of Minog were, in fact, not just geographic. So if you look, for example, at the Rivet in number two, the Rivet writes, Im kiblu oto al atzmam levad, yicholim habanim l'shan oto, im lo nagu bo acharei mitar avihem, vin nagu bo kvar kiblu, v'shuv ein matir no oto vein nishalin alav. If they accepted it on themselves, so they can no longer um, change... Um, now, he doesn't say explicitly that it sounds like his family, but in the Pritoar, he makes it very clear that he thinks the Lolam B'nei Beishan, Heim B'nei Mishpachot, Beishan Kipashta. He says this Gemara tells you that the classic model of Minog is in fact family. Right? In fact, it never was about geography that wasn't the main category. Um, but as I said, this is the minority view. Why is it the minority view? Um, primarily because we have other Gemara that are very explicit um, that parental minhagim are not always binding. So if you look at the Gemara in Chulet, in number four, the Gemara tells the following story, that Amar Mar Ukva, Ana milta chala barchamra legabe Abba. Mar Ukva said, with regard to this matter, I am vinegar the son of wine when compared to my father. I mean, my father was great and I am not. Di'ilu Abba ki have achil bisra ha'idna lo have achil gvina ad lamachar arashta. Because my father would wait 24 hours between Milk and meat. There's your new chumrah, right? Not six hours, not three hours, not one hour, but 24. V'ilu ana, I, however, baha sudata hu dilo achilna. I just won't eat them at the same meal. Li sudata achrita achilna, but I'll eat them at a separate meal. And Amar Shmuel, Shmuel says as well, ana la milta chala barchamra lagabe abba, I'm also... Vinegar, the son of wine, compared to my father. My father would inspect his property twice a day. I only inspect it once. And many of the post skim noted that in this Gemara, it is clear that these people are not bound by their father's customs. Now, if you wanted to defend the notion of parental monogam, how would you reinterpret the second passage, the second Gemara? Yeah. He's still doing the practice. He's just not doing it as frequently. Um, maybe, though it, right, it sounds pretty clear. Like, you know, if someone said, well, I also wait between milk and meat. My parents waited six hours and I wait five minutes. But, you know, <laughs> same thing, right? We would, we would not love that. Um, it's positive. Yeah. They're, like, dispersing themselves for not... Oh, so maybe you think they're wrong. Okay. Um, so in general, the people who want to push back on this just say maybe it just means that, look a custom that your parents accepted as a binding practice for generations is in fact binding. That doesn't preclude the possibility the parent will do something but not make it into their minag, right? It can be that parents do things that they just decide. They only treat as a personal um, practice and not a family minag. Um, but something that they indeed felt was a family minag, maybe that would be binding. And this is, so these are basically the two gemara that are in play. But if you look at the... What if we decide just the, the, the like, kind of overall idea of that before? It's just that you don't really have to follow... Yeah, that here clearly the sons are not following their parents' minhagim. So the question is that indicative to tell you that this is not an obligation. So if you look at most of the Rishonim, you will discover that the, the Ravid and the Pritoar, who's an Achron already, um, are, in the, are in the minority. Um, and the majority understanding of this was, in fact, that the, the, the classic category of Minog is geographic. So if you look, for example, at the Rivash in number five, quoting from the Ramban, so that's already two big names there, um, the Ramban writing in Spain, the Rivash writing in North Africa, writes, Elokol b'nei ir b'chlal takanatan v'afanuladim l'achar mikain. 
All members of the city are within the decree, and even those born later, a community has the right to make a custom on themselves and their children. But wait for a minute and see what he thinks children means. The Ramban wrote, It's not only formal decrees that are binding on future generations, but even mere practices. That they accepted to protect the Torah. The children must also follow it. But then at the end he clarifies, what does it mean? Right, what do I mean children? I don't mean children of a person, I mean... Right? Like I say, if you say you're, right? Ben Yerushalayim, or Ben Yerushalayim, or Ben Chutzlaretz. Right? That means you live there, not you're the children. Uh, ben Chutzlaretz means you are a resident of... In the um, Chavot Yair, um, he says even more clearly, and this is brought in the Pitchei Tshuvah and Shulchan Aruch, First of all, the Pasuk quoted is just an Asmachta, it's just a hint. The only type of custom we're talking about are those accepted by a community. And when the Gemara says that people are bound by the customs in Beishan, that was because they lived in a place called Beishan. In the Pitchei Tshuva, on Shulchan Aruch, he writes, If you want it clearly, a child is not obligated to follow his father's customs. Unless the son continue to practice it as an adult, then they're bound not because their father did it, but because they did it. And But if the father never, the child rather, never kept the father's custom, so then he's not bound. Now that's Ashkenazi Achronim. Svardi Rishonim Ashkenazi Achronim. Now, if you look at the Svardi Achronim Achalchan Arach, similarly, the Pri Chadash Valkol Panim Adin Pashut. It is obvious Sheina Ben Chayav Lin Hoksi Agim Gudero Ravi Vahud Bnei Beishan Shnai Ed Beishan Eino Shem Eishel Shem Makom Dainu Beit Shan. Obviously, children don't have to follow their parents' minagim. The Gemara about Beishan is people from Beit Shan. Not people who were the ch- children of a person named Bashan. And this is found in Bubad Yosef, and it's found in Ugrid Moshe, it's found in the Rav Paalim, it's found in many, many um, poskim. The, the Rambam's father, in fact, quoting this pasuk, right, the pasuk that the Gemara seems to write, thinks that it's about Minhag Yisrael. Right, he uses it for Minag Yisrael, and he says, "Votama minagon in lanu levazotam umashi hinigam zariz umishtadelhu came me karim nasim levozu minag bahauma ukvarim aner via lavashol maltitos torari mecha dat umotech al taazov." Right, the Rambam's father said, "What does the pasuk mean that the Gemara invokes for the source of minhag? It means national custom. Um, that is ten, ten. Right, of my mon avia Rambam." Okay, but the national custom only makes sense if you lived in a place like Egypt, where Judaism was highly centralized. If you live in a place like the States, especially nowadays, like you're not going to get a national custom. Good. So now let us... So let, but let's try to figure this out, right? So we have the classic minog we've seen. There is a minority voice that thinks that parental minogim were binding, a majority voice that geographic minogim were binding. So if I just had that... And then I and I didn't make any sort of logical leaps. What would you just on that source? What would you say in a globalized world? Are we now bound by the ethnic minhagim of our parents? What would you say? No. No. Right. If you just said that, or you would say it comes down to this machloket. Now, to justify the modern practice of basically keeping it as if we still have geographic minhagim, but shifting it to ethnic identity, you could just say, well, maybe. Sure, the majority of Poskim throughout the generations thought it was geographic, and we think it's about parents. So, for example, that's Rabbi Yashiv. Well, it's our to think that we follow our parents. So, good, that's actually. So, 
Let me hold that thought for ten seconds. Rebel Yashiv thinks that we really don't pos- we really do poskins about parents. And he writes this in eleven. Right, he says, no, an individual must follow the customs that their parents accepted as family minhagim. If a parent chooses to do something himself and not make it a family minhag, he doesn't then it's not binding, and that's how he squares the two gemarot. Yeah. Complicated. Yeah. Okay, so what if you have a situation where either your parents are Bali Shuba or they're in the process of getting Bali Shuba and they haven't had you want religion in their family for like a number of years? You want my opinion? You want my opinion or what people will tell you? You want my opinion? They have no binding menhagim at all. Okay. They can so like, accept to be part of whatever community they would like, whatever menhagim they like, they are a tabula rasa. That is my intuition. That is my intuition. And indeed, that is... And indeed, indeed, that is one of the reasons I don't follow all my father's minhagim, because my parents are both Balei Tshuva, so their minhagim were just developed on what they saw as they were becoming from, but like my father has no firm commitment to these minhagim, and therefore, even within whatever, as we'll see, whatever value there might be to family minhagim, and most of these things, it just doesn't exist in my family, and therefore I feel much freer, and things that my wife feels very strongly about, so then we'll just take from her house, or whatever, or things that I have strong halakhic positions, I'll take, I don't, right, I don't necessarily take um, what I did in my house growing up for that reason. Um, that is my, right, that is my intuition. There are many post who, even, for example, post who think that a wife has to take the husband's monogam, which again is not something that's at all clear, um, will say, but if the husband is Baal and the wife is not, it's totally legitimate to say, look, you don't have a tradition, I have traditions, let's, right, that is the exception that many post will make to the rule, which I'm not convinced is the rule, but fine. Um, now, you could come up with a very fancy model. Um, Ray Dovlinzer apparently suggested it exactly that way, which is to say, the Minhag America is to treat Minhag Avot as if it exists, right? That the reason we're bound is because there is the, the right the, the or the international minhag has become to act as if right as if ethnic minhagim uh, exists which maybe is a fair description of the situation but I'm not sure that that's a halachic statement it, it is definitely a fair description but like, no one throw out minhagim until we're finished with this okay I don't want anyone drawing conclusions yet um, okay. Now, there, there is a bit of a problem here. Let's say you did think that minagamakom was the real category and that ethnic minhagim are minagamakom and parent minhagim. You still have the question, which is that people seem to give these minhagim superpowers and say, well, any other minag that you accept on yourself, you could just be mater neder, which would make them all evaporate. People don't think you can do that and give up, right? If, you, if people could do that with kidney oat, they would all do it, right? But everyone says, no, you can't do it. Why is that true? Even if you think... The, these minagim are binding, so why can't you just be maternet there, right? Why can't you just right, nullify the vow? Um, so this is a subject to a machloket. If you look at 12 and 13, the Chadam Sofer says, um, The Chadam Sofer has a surprising position that, to the, that whatever these minagim are, once they are binding, the original generation who accepted it can be Mater Neder because they accepted it so they can undo their acceptance. But their children who became bound in it by generational power cannot un- undo it because they never accepted it. Um, which is surprising. But the Prichadash says that's not true. He wrote, quote the Mari Kolon in 13. And he says, Right? And what are you talking about? If anything, it's the opposite. The people who accepted it, right? The people who accepted it, accepted it. The people who didn't accept it, why can't they get out of it? Um, so that's another complicating um, factor here. Um, similarly, the Prichadash quotes the Mahashtam that if a particular post like challenges, they can challenge it. We'll skip 14 for a minute. Now, um, how would we test the possibility that even if geography was the model, how would we test, because maybe there's another model here, right? 
So far we've set up two models. One is to say that Minog is really all family Minog. That's really the classic model. So obviously you can have Minog in a globalized world. It was never tied to geography to begin with. The other is to say, no, it was always tied to geography. And we saw that this is the majority view, that it's a geographic category. So if it's geography, so what tweak might you make to a geographic model to say that it is um, binding? What would you say? Right? Or how would you test it? You'd, right? What would you have to look for? Right? If you want to see whether geography can move, Right, what would you look for? Cases where yeah. geography moved, or people moved. So what is the Allah? What evidence do we have? So if you look at the Pre-Chadash in 15, he says as follows, This is not the first time people have moved. So what happens if the people in a city are expelled, and they move into a new place? Right, he asked this question, right? You have a entire community that picks up and moves to a new city. Do they keep their old minagim? The whole community picks up and moves, right? This is 15, bottom of the first page. Right, a whole city moves. This happens, right? After the expulsion... Whole communities moved from Spain to Amsterdam to right, South America. So he's really asking this question. Is there ever a time when a community can maintain its geographic identity in a new geography? Right, that's the question you have to answer if you want to accept that geography was the classic model of Minog, but you're now in a globalized world. So what does he say? So he says, "Call ir chadasha im noda rov ansham echan ba'u a kol kiminahag oto amakom she ba'u misham akan l'shono." He said, "Well, it depends." The time it avi ir chadasha. He said, "If they move to a tabula rasa, they move to a place where there is no minag, then in that limited circumstance, he thinks that you can recreate geography, Wait, right? What does that mean, like, Meaning, you can re- right? You can take a community that was in." France was in Paris, and if they move to the middle of Pakistan. Wyoming, and there's no Jews in the area, they can act as if they're still in Paris and m- move the monogam with them. Okay? Yeah. Is that the reality we're talking about? No. no, that's not the reality we're talking about. So what if they move into a place where there were Jews? Yeah. Well, what if there's a minority or a majority situation? Good, so that's what he says. Good, so that's exactly what he says. Top of the second page, he said, let's say one million people move into a city and there are ten Jews there. So what's the halacha? The ten, the million Jews cannot bring the minhagim with them. They must give in to the minhag of the ten because they moved into a new place and that place had a minhag. That is the position of Rechadash. They now have to accept the stringencies of the new place and all their prior commitments evaporate into thin air. Now, according to that model, what customs should all American Jews be keeping? Who knows? Spanish Portuguese. We do know. We know the earliest jewels in America were all Spanish Portuguese communities. Right. Fine, all New Yorkers, fine? Okay. New York, all Ma- in Manhattan at least, okay? okay right? Manhattan, but, but to be fair, all the early shul. And by the way, if, you, if any of you ever read Jonathan Sarna's History of Jews of America, or whatever it's called, American Judaism, whatever, it's the history of the Jews in America, whatever it's called, um, you will see that actually the Spanish-Portuguese community actually believed that. They really felt that anyone who moved in had to follow their customs, and they were furious when people came in and tried to bring in Ashkenazi Minhagim, and there was a lot of fights in New York about setting up Kihilot, and no one was happy with anybody, and it was very, very complicated. Um, it was, uh, it's fascinating, in the history of Kashrut, as it reflected itself through that, Erevin, all types of things were, were um, manifest in this. But the, the pre Hadash argues that it really is geographic. And if a whole you know, million people move and there's a community of 10 people, so too bad. The geography keeps 
right? It determines you move into a new place. It has a minhag. That's it. When you have models like that in post skim, right? You look at what we have and you say, "How did we get here?" Right? Because it seems here is a very nice test case, right? A million people move in to a town with ten people. If minhag was not about geography, it was just a stand-in for identity or social ties or ethnic community, then you would say, okay, in a case like that, a million, either you, you'd have two possibilities. Either the million overpower the ten, and the ten have to accept their minhag, or it's legitimate for both of them to keep their own minhagim. But neither of those are the classic halakh position. The position is the million have to accept the customs of the ten. Yeah. I mean Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Tenmani. I mean, like, right? People who define themselves from, for halachic practice based on their country of origin. Okay. Right? Meaning, I am, am I in any way, shape, or form Ashkenazi? Am I Lithuanian? No. Like, my parent, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, like, my great-grandparents moved to New York in the 1890s or 1880s. Right? What, what connection do I have to those? My mother's side, my mother's from Israel. Like, why am I... Right? Why am I in any way, shape, or form Ashkenazi? In what sense am I Ashkenazi? I'm a New Yorker, right? And yet, right, people look at me and say, oh, you can't eat kidney on Pesach. Why can't I eat kidney on Pesach? That's the minag of New York, right? That's the minag of Israel. It's neither the minag of, right, Cologne, where my mother was born, nor, you know, my family has been in the five boroughs for 120 years, right? What, what connection do I have to some minag Ashkenaz? But people look at me and say, you're Ashkenazi. What, what does it mean, Ashkenazi? Well, you know, your family's from Eastern Europe. Okay, right? So what? Right? But we'll say, no, you're Ashkenazi. You have an identity, right? You have, and they'll say, oh, we love these. I mean, think about it, right? In Israel, we do this all the time, right? Where you, you just went and you watched the celebration, right? The celebrations of, how do you pronounce it? Sigd. 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 Fine. Sigd, right? And people will say, look, isn't it beautiful? The Ethiopian community kept its minagim. But honestly, let's look halachically, right? We, we would wonder, well, why? I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying, right? <laughs> right? Well, why? Well, they're not in Ethiopia. Why should they keep the minag? Right? But it's not just them. We all do this, right? Some of them we, are olim. Like, I think it's different for us because some of, like, we are not... Okay, fine, but you. But still, the point. My, my point is halachically, right? Is that we act as a community as if this means something. That hey, this is great. They keep their minagim, Ashkenazim. We keep our minagim, right? And we keep our minagim. Right? Everyone keeps their minagim. It's beautiful. We have this nice mosaic, right? We have this nice mosaic. Um, but if you look at the classic sources, what? Well, <laughs> might be tell them, Where's this? Where's this come from? Right? You think that you went into a community? 800 years ago, and they would be celebrating the mosaic of customs? Are you crazy? Right? You walked into a place, you kept what the custom was. Don't, right? Don't be an upstart. And again, the Brichadr says that's even if a million people move in. So the classic halachic models force you to ask, what is going on? Yeah. I mean, this was... Correct, but it is the... Well, this is really the question I'm asking, is this is the majority view. This is the view we'll find in pretty much all the classic sources. So, what happened? Right? Meaning, this is really the question I'm asking, is, you're right, it might be that this is what everyone said, and maybe we roll differently, but you know, but no one ever... But when did that happen? Meaning, the traditional halakhic literature is all pointing the direction this is not a legitimate model. Right, this identity model. Right, you're not defined by who your ancestors are. You're defined by where you live. Right, and if you all live in America, then you better have minag America, whatever that is. And if you all live in Israel, minag Israel, or you want to say it goes by cities, fine. Right, minag modi'in. Right, but that's not what people do. Right, you have one Taimani living in a otherwise completely Ashkenazi community. Right, that Taimani will scream if anybody tries to challenge the minagim. My minagim go back. 
thousands of years, you Ashkenazim are upstarts, right? Like, you know, I always, I love talking to Temanim and to, to, right, Syrians and Egyptians will be like, my family was in, I remember the person in charge of, uh, of Sparty something in YU, He's like, I am 82nd generation, right? My family was the first generation who left Egypt. You know, Egypt. My family can trace their lineage back from the time of Shlomo Amelech of Syria. His wife was Egyptian, he was Syrian. And he was like, literally, they have, they have documents proving that they moved to Syria in the time of Shlomo Amelech and have been there straight for thousands of years, right? They were like the first generation to leave. I, you're not telling me how to change my customs, right? They're like, the shul in Syria, that we went to in Syria was built by Yoav ben Sruya when David Amalek conquered Syria. Do I know that's true? No. The fact that I can't prove it's not true is quite striking. Um, but the... But how did that happen, right? How did... We, and we all take this as a given. And it's not just us. You look at the same post Right, the same post game. Who, and let me just make this point. And this is where I'm stuck, a little bit. Um, that the same post game. Who say that family minagim are not binding? Will say, but minag svarad, minag ashkenaz are binding. Right, Ravadi Yosef will say, parent parental minagim are not binding. But it, he'll say, svaradim have to follow the big Yosef always. Right. Now, admittedly, that's from a second model, which, as I mentioned, is the Rajba. So let's just look at it. That the Rajba comes up with this category that, in addition to what we call Minag, this notion of Mara Da'atra can be expanded um, beyond geography. And he writes um, that based on this model, just look at the bold in 17. <speaking in Hebrew> That based on these models of Mardatra, that can be exchanged for geography, um, and you can accept the, you know, these communities who no longer follow their own rabbi, they follow the Rambam, they follow the Rift, they follow, follow Shulchan Aruch. Now, to be fair, that Rajba is still only half an expansion. It expands the notion of Mardatra, meaning the rabbi can be virtual, the authority can be virtual, but not that the, the community that's accepting that authority is not geographic, right? He's talking about a geographic community that accepts the Rambam. Um, but this quickly becomes, if you look at the Urim Vitumim, you look by time you get to Ravad Yosef or Moshe Feinstein, etc., um, this becomes that you are bound. Svardim have to follow Svardim and Agim and Ashkenazim have to follow the Rama, right? And this just becomes a given. And the question you have to really ask is, when did that happen? How did that happen? What is the model that dictates this. Yeah. A lot of people don't like to think of their lives as being governed like strictly by halakha and like minhagim are what creates like, personal significance for like so many people to do this. So if you like, I don't know, if you like try to like take that away from people, then a lot Good. So the answer might be that right now, let's let's uh, let's let's set up our options now. Okay, let's set up our options. Given that there is a good argument that can be made in the halachic sources that Minog classically really was geographic and not family, um, and given one second, let me just help on the problem. And given the reality that most of us exist as if Minhag Eida ex- exists, we, we treat ourselves like Ashkenazim, Sephardim, and the like. So, what moves are could we make now? Right, we have several options. Right, we could. Right, what are the, we could well, outline the options. Option one is to say, despite the fact that it's a minority position, that, fam, that Minhagim follow the family line, maybe despite the fact that that wasn't the majority view throughout Jewish history, that's what we follow. Okay? Second halachic model is to invent a category, which is to say that there is something in between Minhag makom and Minhag Mishpacha called Minhag Eida, which, while Family monogamy may not be binding. Maybe there's something. There is an ethnic group thing which is binding in Allah, and then we're going to have to justify that, right? The third model is what's the third model? Since you're suggesting it, what's the third model? No, no, no. What did you just say? What you just said is the third model because. Yeah, the third model is to say, look, maybe it's not halakhically binding, but that doesn't mean it's meaningless. Right? Either because kibra va'im would be one model to put it under, or 
what you said is in fact what um, the Maritz Chiyot said. Ritzvi Hirsch Chayis, who is fascinating, he is the only person in the Gemara who is in, printed in the standard Vilna Shas who had a doctorate. Right, who had a PhD, Rabbi Dr. Tzvi Hirsch Chayis, um, writes this in his Darke Hara. There's a fascinating, if you ever want to know about Maritz Chayis, there's an excellent dissertation written on it by um, Bruria Hutner. Rav Hutner's daughter, um, an excellent, excellent dissertation. It's available online by the Marzchias. Um, he argues that, yeah, the reason that minag is so important in halacha is not per se the formal component of it. It's because the average person, their relationship to Judaism is more about custom or what they do than what is halachic, right? They don't know the difference. And What? Correct. Therefore, his suggestion is the following. He, he's not yet talking about what I'm talking about, but he's talking about minag in general. And his suggestion is as follows. Let's say you have a minag that's just stupid. Right? It has no basis whatsoever. It's not us, sir. It's just stupid. So what should you do? So here's his suggestion. Don't fight it. If people do it, let them do it. Because if you fight people's customs, you will weaken their commitment to Judaism Period. Because people don't necessarily distinguish between real minhagim, fake minhagim. They just don't. But he said, on the other hand, let's say the minhag dies. It just dies. People stop practicing it. Should you fight to revive it? No, let it die. Because if what gives custom its importance is the fact that people do it and are connected to it, so while they're connected to it, don't fight it. Don't challenge what is meaningful to them. But if it disappears... Don't pretend that it's some super halakhic category that you have to reinstate. Now, you could take that type of model and say, look, you're right. Really, truly, deep down, we don't believe that Ashkenazim are Ashkenazim and Svardim are Svardim. But if you start challenging Minhagim, right, people are going to lose their identity. But if the reality is that slowly but surely a Israeli identity is emerging that blends a little bit of Ashkenaz and a little bit of Svarad. Or America, or whatever that's truer in Israel than it is in America. So don't fight it. Don't encourage it, don't fight it. Let history, right, let history take its course, and whatever happens, happens. That would be a third model, which is to say, look, right, so again, the models are, say, you know what, we don't have any tenable explanation for it, throw it in the garbage. Right, really be paskin that parental minagim are not binding, Ethnic minhagim, Ashkenazi minhagim are no different than family minhagim. That halachic literature says it's not binding, get rid of it. Right? That's one model. Other extreme is to paskin and say, no, we follow family minhagim. They really are binding. Third model is to invent a new category, which is to say there's something in between geographic minhagim and family minhagim. Maybe family minhagim per se are not binding, but there's something in between, and we'll see positions like that. And then there's a fourth model, which is to say, maybe it's not really binding, but we can accept a middle model, which is to say, it's not quite binding, but that doesn't mean it's meaningless, so don't fight people. Allow people to use that as their starting point to orient themselves in Judaism. And if certain minhagim start to blend, and certain identities start to fade away, and new identities take their place, so let it happen. Right? Let it happen. Yeah. Good, I think you're 100% right. I think you're 100% right. Now, that insight is what lies... I mentioned this position, but since you bring it up, now I'll, I'll spell it out. Ramosha Feinstein, as I said, argues that a wife has to accept her husband's minhag. His argument is because since the classic minhag was, minhagim were geographic-based, what could be more geographic than moving into a new home, right? And the, right, the wife moves into the husband's home and therefore accepts his minhag. That's his argument. Rav Henkin responds and says, what are you talking about? There's a machloket in Shulchan Arach, but machloket Rishonim, really. If there's a dispute between a husband and a wife, where they should live, where the wife is from, where the husband is from, who has the upper hand, assuming they bring it to court? I'm not sure that's the best way of resolving it, but let's say they did bring it to court. So who would win? So it's a machloket, so we pass in the wife. So Rav Henkin says, wait a second. 
because that's that's the consent that's the consensus view. That that's what it is. We can get into that a different time. But he says that's it. fine, fine. But he says, what does that show you? He said, what is this notion that a woman has to accept her husband's monogamy? The classic minagalacha is place, and people lived normally where their family was, so. There was a, an overlap. But if you're saying that a woman can force her husband to move to where her family's from, then de facto, she's forcing her husband to accept her minhagim because he's now going to be bound by the minhagim makom, which means that there is no, no such model that a woman must accept her husband's minhagim because you see that there's actually models in Allah that tell you the opposite. Now, he goes on to say that doesn't mean it's not a good rule of thumb. Right? If a woman wants to accept her husband's minhagim, that's fine. Right? But she doesn't have to. Now, we can take a model like that with Menagida. We say, like, you know, you want to, you don't want to, whatever. Right? It's a good idea for people to keep and hug him. Yeah? The whole notion that one spouse has to adopt the and hug him with their other spouse like, shows how important it is for like, everybody who's living in one house to have the same practice. Sure, but again, I'm not convinced of this, right? If. And Ramosha Feinstein in one place says wives have to take God's minagim, but then he says that's only minagim that are family and not just about her. For her, for right, minagim that only affect the woman, she can take her own minagim. It's things that affect the whole family, the kids should have to do those things too. Correct, but I, you know, my tendency is to think that's more pragmatic, is that you want, right, you don't want complete, ca- right. That, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's my tendency to think, and therefore I think it's more about having a single minagim than whose minagim it is, right, I think educationally that's important, um, right. Yeah. Right, meaning I don't think it, right, but I tend not to be convinced by the arguments that, that you have to accept only the husband's minhag. I, I, I just think, no, no, I agree with you. I, that, I agree. People don't like when I say this, or rabbis don't like when I say this. I tend to agree with you. I think that's what the halakhic evidence points to. I'm not convinced by the arguments. Otherwise, I do think that there's a value to having somewhat consensus minagim within a family. What those minag is, I'm less convinced, as you will see in general, by these very firm um, you have to follow this. I, I'm not as convinced. That, by the way, is going to be my conclusion. I'm going to describe what I see, but I'm right. Part of my contention is that um, these models are being fought out um, at the moment because we sort of jumped to an assumption that minag hamakom can simply be cr- recreated as minag eda, but I don't know that that is 100% um, legitimate. Um, okay, so. Um, if you look at 21 and 22, you'll see sort of these middle minhagim, uh, middle middle models. Siach uh, Nachum. I don't know who Siach Nachum is. Um, Rav Nachum Rabbi Navich. I don't know who that is. The Rosh Hashiva of Yeshivat Male Adumim, Yeshivat Berkat Moshe. Um, he is wonderful. Um, for anyone who's, no one's from Toronto, right? We said no one's from Toronto. Well, anyways, for anyways, he was a rabbi. He was a rabbi in Toronto. He's a PhD from University of Toronto in applied mathematics, probability in the Talmud. Very complicated book. It's sitting on my shelf at home. Um, my eyes sort of glaze over as I try to read it. But, uh, but um, and I do like math. But maybe at some point I'll get through it. Um, fascinating person. So in his Shuvat Siach Nachum, he already begins a middle model in terms of minag avot, and he says v'chol minhag kazet zarech adam lihitchashiv b'mishpachto v'chaverav. With any custom, you have to take into account your family and your friends. He uses the, the halachic phrase, so you aren't standing amongst those sitting or sitting amongst those standing. Because it will cause fights and for people bad-mouthing each other. Because of the emotional components here, the emotional charge in these issues, I tell people to follow what their parents do to not embarrass their parents. Right? So he says, look, there is a value to family minhagim, but it's not because it's a binding minhag, it's because there's emotional charge, it causes pain in the family, right? So that's a model, which is to say, you know what, we're not talking classic minog models, we're talking something else. Okay. But that's justifying already family minog, and it's saying it's not really about minog, it's about something else, and okay. so it's sort of true, sort of not. That's a different issue. Correct. It's a different issue, so that's what I said. One issue is, one model is to say, look, this is a different issue, right? To come up with some other model. Um, now, Rav Vosner, in 22, is aware of this problem. Rav Vosner was um, a 
19th and 20th century posaic, and I think an 18th, 19th, and century, or 19th, 20th, and 21st century person. Um, he lived, sorry, he was 19th, 20th, and 21st century posaic. I think he lived over three centuries. He died at like, no one's quite sure when he, how old he was when he died, but he died a few years ago. He was anywhere between 104 and 112, which would have placed him as being like, born around the time of the McKinley assassination. Um, he, was, he lived for a very long time. He was the Posig of B'nai Brock, one of the Posig of B'nai Brock, very impressive Posig. Um, he deals with this question, and he takes the model of saying, no, it's not about Menegah vote, this is not, but it is real. So what's his model? His model is to invent a new category, which he calls Minhag HaShevet. That apparently we're just... We're just going in the wrong direction here. You're trying to recreate Minag Avot or Minag Hamakom. That's not what's going on here. Is that what's, what's emerged is a different category called Shvatim. Maybe you like that better than Eida, ethnic, whatever you want. But he calls it Shevet. Right? Tribal identity. Um, and that is binding. And that's what he writes. Yislachli. Um, yeah. Forgive me that I'm only answering you now. Right, you have Svardim and Ashkenazi Yeshiva, and vice versa. So now they are affected both by their minhag of being a Svardi or an Ashkenazi and their Yeshiva. What do you do? So he says, It seems obvious to me, It seems obvious to me that an Ashkenazi who is in a Svardi place or a Svardi city with a few Ashkenazim and they don't have their own shul, their own community, then the halacha is... That what? The minority follows the majority. That's what all the classic halachot are talking about. A few Ashkenazim move into a Sephardi place, they've got to keep the new minagim. That's what we're talking about. And the other way around. Um, and he says that even if eventually the Ashkenazim were to outpace the Sephardim, if they came in one at a time and became Sephardi, right, one at a time, so then they... Even by the end, it happens to be more Ashkenazim. Doesn't matter. The Sephardi Minag would overpower. But what if, what if they all come at the same time? Okay. So then he says, skip down to. Um, to. Um, let's see. Skip down to. Vehageder Right, four paragraphs in the bottom. Vagedera Zalpi Chuvara Gaon Zichron Yosef. Which is quoted in the Pitchei Chuva, which we saw. Deena ben Mechuyavlin Hoka Avotav Zulam, Inim Hergilu Avotav in Hig King. He said, Look, we know, we, we rule that fundamentally a parent's menag isn't binding on their child unless the child accepted it himself. Mashain Ginim ben Loit Hilk Menag Avotav Mishig deal. Vachronim Natulu Shitazo Shachron Yosef. He said, The consensus. Psak, I have to agree, is that parental minagim are not binding per se. Right? They're binding if the child chooses to follow them, but they're not fundamentally binding. Aval, he said, but that's not what we're talking about here. Davar shekibela, that's mo shevet shalem bechal Yisrael. But if there's not a family minag, but it's a tribe. So then, kamo minag heya svaradim. Like Svardi positions, because they are Svardi. And they've been following this tribal position for hundreds of years. And similar to the Ramash, it's then you don't need to accept it anew. You are bound by virtue of the fact that you are part of this tribe. So here is the models we have so far. Okay? Classic Minak. 
Majority view is that geography is the defining characteristic. Minority view is that family monogamy or binding. What do you do in a modern reality when, right, how do you justify the modern reality that now we have this mid middle category called Eida, Shevet, whatever you want to call it, Ashkenazim, Svaradim, whatever you want to call it. Okay? So what models do we have available to us? So, model one is to say that despite the fact this was the minority view, we in fact think that family monogamy are binding. This is Rebel Yashin. Okay? Opposite extreme would be to say, no, nope. nowadays there's just no binding minhagim. Get over it. Right? We don't live in that world. This is all one big mistake. Okay? Middle model is to say there's a middle type of category, a da or shevet. This is um, the Shevet Alevi, Rebuzner, which is to say, this is why in our modern world we treat this as important, because this is a different category called Eda. Alternatively is to say, another middle category would be to say, it's a quasi minak right? It's not really binding, right? But we treat it as binding, either because Amar Tzchiyah's type argument, which is, look, don't shake people's traditions, right? Don't shake people's faith, right? Don't shake people's commitments, or really their faith, based on commitment. Just don't do it. It's a bad idea, right? Meaning this is, we treat it as if this exists, or some sort of keep it up, a model. But it's not really what it looks like, and therefore if it morphs, so let it morph, right? So let it morph. Um, 15 minutes. Okay. Very quickly, let me summarize for you Rabbi Lamb's article, which I'm not going to read all of it. Right? I'm not going to read all of it, but I gave it to you. Um, Rabbi Lamb was asked this in the 70s, I think. Um, let me summarize it for you outside. Okay? It's a really an excellent article. It's worth reading. Um, but, so that we only take two weeks on this topic and not three. Right? I will summarize this article. Next week we'll read the sources... Um, where I argue that, right, so far I've argued this is basically a 20th century problem. What I want to do next week is show you that I'm not sure that what I just said is true, and I've come to become convinced that this problem is older than I have admitted in the past, um, and I want to explain why I think that's true, and then we can, it's an open question of what the implications of that are. What? How old are we assuming it is right now? So my, I always thought that basically this was a modern phenomenon, right, 20th century. Um, yeah, because I figured that, you know, right, it was only after the total upheaval of the world where millions of people, right, meaning maybe it started a bit earlier, maybe 19th century, 19th. Um, what we're going to see is that that's not, that's only somewhat true. Um, there are hints that this started to become an issue in the 16th century. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Like, any time after the Middle Ages, basically, it seems like it would make Correct. So th there is some evidence of that, and we're going to, we're going to see that, um, I still think it's mostly a modern phenomenon, but... Well, all our problems are now mostly modern. Yes, that, that is definitely true. Um, okay. So Rabbi Lamb was asked this question. This is how it came up. Okay? Rabbi Lamb wrote an article in, the, in, in uh, Beit Yitzchak. Beit Yitzchak. Beit Yitzchak. It's, okay. It is called Beit Yitzchak. It's, it's, it's the YU Journal. Um, I had the unfortunate experience of being the editor of that for several years. Um, that's unfortunate. Unfortunate, yes. It's... Painful. Is that not what you wanted? No, I got bullied into it. Do you know how hard it is to edit over 700 pages of badly written... Uh, not, mu not everyone knows how to write Hebrew well. So some of it was well written, but of that 700 pages, many hundreds of pages were not well written. Torah, Chidushim, it was painful. Um, <laughs> what? Well, look, it was... Look, when, when you open it up to everybody, so some of them are going to be good, some of them are bad. First, you have to sift through the good and the bad, and then you have to choose what you publish, and even that, you have to edit and copy edit. And the Rosh Yeshiva always want to put in articles, but they don't, don't they didn't necessarily get the memo about deadlines. So you have to chase them down. There's a lot of work that goes into it, and part of it was fun. I'm glad I that's behind me. Um, that is so. Anyway, so he wrote an article about um, naming children after live people. Okay? Um, which, as we know, Svartim 
do and Ashkenazim don't. Okay, that's basically what it is. Um, so, Rabbi Lam in that article suggested that, well, look, if an Ashkenazi wants to do it, let him do it. Because maybe it's not really binding after the Shoah, because we're not really Ashkenazim. That was his suggestion. Suggestion. Someone responded to Rabbi Lam. Meaning he's he's saying, I don't. He's yeah, meaning basically he, he opened up the possibility. He said maybe there is an Ashkenazi minhag, but are we really Ashkenazim? Because we don't live in Europe, is that? Yeah, exactly. Meaning about? post Shoah, we just call ourselves Ashkenazim, but we're American, yeah. right? That that's his argument. And there was a response. Someone wrote to him and said, "How dare you, right? How dare you say that? Because if you're saying that, yes, this is a minor minhag." I mean, we're at two prongs. One is this is not such a strong minute to begin with. The second one is I'm not convinced that Ashkenaz Svar really exists. And this person yelled at him and said, are you out of your mind? Right? Are you telling me that Ashkenazim are allowed to eat kidney? Right? That was what he said. Right? Yes, yes they can. Right? Right? As he says, So, I, I, I love Rabbi Lam. I really do. Um, and I love Rabbi Lam. I really do. So, I love Rabbi Lam. I really do. So look at the article. Right? This is the summary. That was the summary in this middle paragraph, right? Where Rabbi Lam tells you how this article came into being, and he writes as follows: Right? He's very polite. Right? He said, uh, "Please, right, my dear friend, I read your article." So look at the, the, the last paragraph in this page. Let me, let me speak about your fundamental critique. He said, you challenged me because I said, basically the argument that we've said. I actually came up with this before I saw Rabbi Lamb's article, so I was very happy to <laughs> see that Rabbi Lamb wrote this, and it gave, it, it gave me confidence what I was saying. He said, you said that if in fact that I'm right, that we paskin, that parental menhagim are not binding, and Therefore, now that we don't live in Ashkenaz anymore, so this minag doesn't really apply. So you said, are you willing to take the consequences of this and say that Ashkenazi doesn't exist? We can eat kidneyot. Right, you said to me, everyone acts as if they're Ashkenazim, if they're Svardim. Are you really telling me that this doesn't exist? He says, He said, good point. Avaloa light, tlunatcha, kimal chavod yair. Said, you're right. It's a good point. But you're not challenging me. You're challenging all of those poskim who, in fact, said that yes, that the minag category of minag and alacha is place and not family. Velo rakalav, el gamori vashmenu sha, 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 vikar da to bazev alaran. So it's not just chavod yair. He said, you're challenging everybody. But this is the simplest understanding of the entire tradition that we have about minhagim. Yes. And he said, yes, you are correct. This is the Chora Kushat Sumav. And he said, you have asked a good question, which has no good solution. He says, you're right. You're asking a very good question. How did this happen? That people started treating themselves as if they have the Minagim of their places of origin. You can't tell me they're a place. They're not a place. They're not a place, yeah. Yes. Yep. And he says, I mean, look, that's what he says. He says, Where did this come from? That you have to follow it. Said, and then he adds that the historians think that Ashkenazim and Agim are more Israeli. 
originally Eretz Yisrael, Menach Sfarad Bavel, okay. Uminogel lanu hayom. We have to look at the halachic background for this assumption in America. So Rabbi Lehm thinks this is a modern problem, right? The 20th century problem. He says, this is a unique American problem or Israeli problem or 20th century problem because there's been mass immigration, right? There was never a time in history where literally all of Jewry just scattered from their original places and recongregated in new countries that quickly. That's true. It's never happened to that scale. He said, we really had two different options. We could have theoretically ended up in a situation where we created one universal minog. That could have been what happened. That could have been the result of globalization. That we become one global Jewish community. But that's not what happened. People remain groups. Zer sham, zer sham, a little bit here, a little bit there. Shem hishichu et hamin hagim shal artzot motzam v'arei pizurayim v'lod mazgul l'kila achad v'aflo birachad. Rather than creating one national or even one city-wide minog. This is what happened. Ukshem shevanu chadneser bilbel et umot kach vo amot l'amerika v'yifrika b'neem. He said, just like the Vuchadnezar confused all the genera- right, all the peoples, the people came to America, and it just, this is just what happened, right? We became these disparate groups within one geographic place. And it's clear that in the American context, you can't, we, there is, right, we can't just create these key, great kilo. So he says, so how did this, how did this happen? So then he goes on, and he says, well, there's geography, um, right, he goes through different models. Um, let me so skip to the next paragraph. He says there are two ways to understand what happened here. He said, one option is really to reject this and say, really, you're right, geography is only binding in geographic places. And that's it. We could, that we could take that direction. Um, and he says, I can prove that from the fact that so much of halacha emphasizes the poskim b'she'arecha, right, in your gates, in your city, right? There is just so much geography talk. Maybe that's really what we meant. In which case, there are no minhagim anymore. Um, he said, and maybe the Minhage Ashkenaz originally were just an extrapolation of this and saying geography won't be judged by city, it'll be judged by huge geographic region. Um, but if that was what you thought happened, that Minag Ashkenaz and Sard originally were just an expansion of Makom from a city to a country, and from a country to a continent, so then, you're right, nowadays there would be no Minag. However, it's possible... That this is not the case. And he suggests a new model. He says the second would be to say that this is mishpachot. Um, right? You could say that this is an expansion of minag mishpachot with all the problems that come with it. So then he comes up, but I have a third suggestion. He says maybe the following. In the time of Chazal, there was some evidence of minhag which are not ge- just geography based, and that's what were called the, um, those were the economic guilds. The economic guilds. Um, you could have the carpenter guild that would impose customs of practice in their city. So Rabbi Lam suggests, he says, maybe this proves that there is precedent in halacha for buy-in. For buy-in, right? For optional buy-in, because you identify. Now, this is hard because that's really a financial model, 
right? Carpenters in a particular city accepted it to be part of the guild, so you have it. But he said, maybe we can talk about that. If I belong to a shul, I buy into that guild, and maybe there's a similar model for Minog. And maybe that's what B'nai Eida is. And he says, therefore, maybe it's not just a dope, but maybe that's why you can be bound by your shul minhagim, or something like that. Um, so he says in page 7, that's what he suggests. And this is his model. He said, my model is the following. Maybe our minhagim come from shuls and yeshivot and chasidish groups. From the model established from the economic guilds. In English, voluntary association. Right? He says maybe in America the model is that we learn from B'nai Umanut that you can create Minhagim based on voluntary association. And maybe that is why Minhagim are binding. That is his suggestion for a new model. Um, now he says, I'm not really convinced that this is true. Right? But this is his suggestion. Now, I would suggest reading the article if you get the time, but let me point out some of the points that Ray Lam um, hints at that I think are very powerful. Um, I'm not convinced by his model, per se, right? Because it really is an economic model. But I'll tell you what I am convinced of. Ray Lam says, why does he go in this model? The reason he goes in this direction is because, if I asked you the honest question, which is how many of you, or how many of your, you, do you think your parents want to give up on the notion that they're Ashkenazi or Sephardi? Right? How many people want to? The, the answer is that most people don't. When do people like this year? When do people jump on this year when I say maybe this is all a mistake? Kidnia, right? They have certain minhagim they don't like, right? And then they say, oh, it can't be binding. But if I ask most people, do you really want to give up all of your identity? Right? Do you really want to start from scratch and have to justify yourself every time you rely on a kula of the Rama and eat at a restaurant in America that doesn't have a Jew lighting the fl- that doesn't have a Jew cooking but only had a Jew lighting the flame? Right? Do you want to start from scratch? Do you want to start from scratch when you figure out what you're supposed to do at your seder? Right? Do you want to start from scratch? What will they tell me? Ninety percent of the time? No. No, that's not what I want to do. There's certain minagim I don't like, but if I had to do it again, I basically would continue identifying as I identify. So I think Rabbi Lamb is a fair description of what has happened. Right? Which is that people, in the end of the day, don't really want to give up on identity. They want to be part of Ashkenazim, Svartim, whatever. They just... Right? And, yeah, there are things that they don't like. But, you know what? That's life. Right? Sometimes you move into a city because you like it 90%, 90% of what happens there, and 10% you swallow because you live there. I think Rabbi Lamb is right descriptively that that's how people treat Minhagim. Right? Is that fundamentally they really do want to be part of an identity, an identity group. They just, right? They don't love everything about it, so, you know, when it comes to those things, they jump on it. Again, is this a halachic model? I'm not convinced. But maybe this is one of those middle models, which is to say, look, as a starting point, as a rule of thumb, Maybe we're sort of Ashkenazim, right? It's our minhag to treat ourselves as if we're Ashkenazim and Svartim and whatever. A middle model like that, though, if you assume it's not a formal model, right? Ray Lam suggests it's a formal model, though he's not convinced. But if you say, no, it's not necessarily a formal model, but it's a good description of what we do, then maybe the halakhic result will be, barring extenuating circumstances, you should act as an Ashkenazi, but let's say someone really doesn't want to, they want to become Svarti, Right? Would you say it's legitimate? Yeah. Yeah. Right? So those are, I think, the models that we have, right? So, so we have the models to say this is binding, either because all family monogamy are binding, or we think there's a category called a Shevet or a or you're convinced by a lamb that we have basically become part of a voluntary association that's binding based on Minhag Umanut, right? Minhag Umanut and the like, 
Or you take some sort of middle model, which is say, no, we sort of, we treat it as a starting point, either because keep it off aim, or because we don't want to shake people's faith, or because that's really what we want to do, right? It's not 100% binding. We understand that there might be distinctions, and we'll flesh out the details when it comes to that, but we'll act as if that's where we exist. Or, theoretically, you could say, no, we really reject it. Those are the models that are, um, are live. The reality of the way Jews live is that we live somewhere in the middle, right? Is that either we accept this as binding or at least as our starting point. Um, what I want to do next week is show that this is not completely a new issue. It is maybe exacerbated by the 20th century, but it's not completely new. And like I said, I don't have firm answers, right? And what I tell people is that, look, this is my description of what has happened. I cannot promise you that in 20 years, the community will not decide, you know what? We really aren't Ashkenazi anymore. And as I said, in Israel, you see the beginnings of this, that people are less and less convinced, and Minhagim are blending, and what that will lead to in 20 years, and whether descriptively this will be true. Right? I think these will be the potential models. Whether descriptively it will be true that most people want to stay in this Eidah Shevet model, I don't know. Um, but this is the halakhic problem. Like I said, I'm, ex- I'm being honest with you, and I'm not sure that this is the right or only halakhic conclusion that we could have reached, or even the one that we will continue to reach in the future. This is just my description of the models that could have emerged and the ones that did. Yeah. Last question, and then we'll see the Next week we'll just, you know, you can read the Rabbi Lamb's article, but I'm going to focus on the, uh, the pages that start with Mazash Kanazi, where I point out that this is not completely new, that this did begin in the, uh, begin earlier and see what that might tell us about these halakha. Yeah. Are you assuming, though, that you have to choose between Ashkenazis and, like, Sfarad? Because, like, no, I'm just using that, as opposed to, like, Minak Teman or... Or could you just, like, take your own, like, your own Again, so I think, I think that if you... Definitely, if you think this is a mistake, you could choose your own monogam. And even if you're in the middle, right, you could say, look, for most people, there's a starting point. But if it becomes the fact that there isn't such a starting point, then yeah, you could change it. And that's going to be, this is where things are going to get more malleable in this, in this uh, middle category. But we'll flesh it out a bit more next week. Um, like I said, I think this is one of the most important issues that is under-discussed in modern halakhic uh, literature. But we will, uh, we'll, we'll come back to it next week, okay?